Hi everyone, welcome to the Beyond Deadlines podcast, where we tackle challenges that planning and schedule leaders come across on a day-to-day basis. My name is Greg Lawton, and I'm the CEO of an AI schedule management company called Nodes and Links. And I'm Mike Pippo, a planning and scheduling manager for Intel. Each podcast is designed to give you strategies and tactics that you can implement right away. Today, our man Micah is on the hot seat, and we're talking about developing schedule specifications. So, Micah, you are the planning and scheduling manager at a major data center company. When, when you started, the company had an outdated schedule specification. One key aspect of improving delivery is updating the specification. Could you please explain to the audience what a schedule specification is and how you would go about updating it? Yeah, so this is a great topic for me because at night to go to sleep, I have a stack of specifications next to my bedside and I just pick them up and I read them and it's better than Ambien, folks. They will put you to sleep right away. There's a lot of variety out there across all industries, but essentially what you'll have is a uh, a major, or not a major, the actual, what's the right term for it? The main contract. And that will have basically your key milestones in it. And so then for this contract to not, for the construction project, to not blow up into 10,000 pages, you'll have supplemental materials. And so you'll have specifications. The specifications highlight for an owner to a general contractor, what are the sorts of things that they have to follow or, or you're looking for to do planning and scheduling. And there's specifications for all different sorts of fields. There are quality specifications, commissioning specifications, uh, safety specifications. And again, it's really just to think about this as you have the main contract that has like the very key points in it, and then it'll have a sentence in there that says you must follow the specifications. And then in the contract, they'll probably put the key milestones, but then all that other information will be put in a planning and scheduling specification. Um, Years ago, they were called CPM specifications. But as we know today, CPM is really just an algorithm that you can use as part of your planning and scheduling process. And now they're more, I would say, modern and updated. Well, for a lot of the advanced programs to include a lot more things in the planning and scheduling world. Beautiful. So let me t- let me make an analogy to hopefully make it the language simpler for people because specification is one of those words. It's like synergy or collaboration. <laughs> It's like, okay, I'm just using it because I'm using it. Um, To me, what you just described, a specification is like, we've invented a game. Let's call it golf. The main contract says the winner is the person who gets the ball, only hitting it with a stick, into 18 holes in the least amount of shots. A specification document then would be how big the hall is, what color it is, does it have a flag in, these kinds of things. What the green, the rough, the uh, the sand, the course, like you would have documents that go into greater detail, but at the top of it, yeah. people go, cool, the least shots, the better. Got it. Yep. Yeah. I think it's a, a perfect, perfect analogy. Cool. And so so what I... is in a schedule specification document? Like what's in there? <laughs> it depends who wrote it. And I mean, there's many, I'll put some links of examples in the show notes, but to start out with the software that you're going to mandate using, uh, and, and then, and then a lot of times for your more traditional specifications, they just become a user manual for the software that picks the preferences. Anyone who has used any scheduling software, they have loads of different, um, buttons and features you can use. And depending on the situation and what you want to use them for, some of those buttons and features are good and some of them are bad. For example, uh, P6 has many sorts of constraint types. You know, there's finish on or after and, you know, uh, constraint mandatory finish on. Some of those are good to use. Some of those are bad to use. Some of those you use at the very last milestone. Some of those are okay to use at intermediate milestones. So it, the, the specification really starts to walk through I would say the more traditional ones, essentially, how do I use whatever scheduling software I am across the project? Now, the the more newer takes on these is, okay, we actually need to start laying out 
what we're going to do across the planning process and the scheduling and the progressing process. Because if you only focus on your scheduling software and that piece, you miss a whole wide world of planning and scheduling. So, you know, that gets into how are we going to do baseline reviews? How is the actual go from no schedule to GC gives you a schedule to you baseline it to then you go progress it through? And so that's, you know, that's some of the sorts of things you'll find in specifications. To me, good ones are process based and then how do you operate the software based? They can also include examples. So example reports, example templates and things like that. I'm, I'm going to use a little, a little bit of a, a sales framework here to push you on this. Um, Micah, let's imagine I don't have a schedule specification framework. So what? Why do I care? You're, just, you're talking about stuff that's boring. Why do I care that I don't have this document? Why do you think they're by my bedside at night to put me to sleep? <laughs> yeah, you don't need them, Greg. But if you're going to build more than one project, and uh, let's just talk about data structures. So you're a, a major company, whatever company you want to be, rail, nuclear, data, and you're going to build more than one project. If you don't have a specification, it is very unlikely that you're going to get your data back in a structured format that you can use. And and let's actually, I'll challenge myself even on that one, even on a singular project. Mm -hmm. You don't want to sit there and waste months and months and months and months working back and forth with your general contractor to get them to give you a schedule report that works for you just on one project. I mean, think about the amount of cycles you're going to have to sit through to be like, okay, no, I want um, an early start and I want late finish and I want total float uh, and I need it broken down by these WBSs. Um, and can you include these milestones? And by the way, oh, I need these milestone IDs to be these specific milestone IDs. You're going to waste loads of time versus here's my specification for what I want. And so I think the biggest sales pitch to me is structured process and data for optimization on your end so as an owner you can save time money energy and headaches getting what you need to go do what you need to do got it so what you're telling me in greg language is that specifications <laughs> specifications are collaboration scale assets and I'll, yep. I'll pick those collaboration because you write rules so that people can work together in ways that make sense Scale means the 10 hours you put into the document and the 100 hours people spent reading it is less than the 1,000 hours of going back and forth, fucking things up and getting it wrong and having to go cycles through the project. So essentially, you're investing time to get a return so that people can work together much more productively and smoothly. So you're saying to me that if I'm a manager, that wants people to work together in a collaborative way and wants to increase productivity, this is kind of something I've got to do. Yeah. And based on one of my favorite song lyrics of all time, every rose has a thorn. So mm -hmm. I think I love how you approached it in terms of collaboration, because oftentimes people don't take that angle of collaboration. And that's where you get what I'll call the kitchen sink specification. They aren't thinking of the people who are actually as people who are going to then build the schedule and collaborate with. They're thinking of it as a, you need to do this every single little thing. And I'm going to mandate those things in which you need to do. So mm -hmm. oftentimes I would say in traditional specifications, you, you, you see them just become like weird extension legalese of the contract where it says, you know, every little button click, every little thing. And that's where, in terms of collaboration, no one wants to actually go read those things. You know, that who's going to sit down and read a hundred page document and then be able to follow that. And so it, when it, we kind of transition back to like how I would go deliver that, I think I'd take your approach and then try and maximize off that and think of it. I am going, this is just a pure collaboration document. So how do people in the modern age collaborate? They probably don't do it off a hundred page documents. I used to write a long form newsletter, newsflash everyone, no one reads. So you're going to need to add in video, 
diagrams, pictures, examples, you know, go for that six second attention span if you really want people to pick up and use what you're doing. I, I really like that, 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 that actually, and I'll, I'll pull on that and say, for me, these kind of specifications should also tell me why. So for example, no hard constraints on milestones, please. Because I want to run a Monte Carlo simulation and see where this thing will finish. And if you put hard constraints on, fuck up my analysis. Please don't do that. That's a 20 second video. And you could, you could have a, a data bank of videos and say, when you join, please just look over these. And by the way, you could get the transcript and go, there's all the transcript. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The other thing when you explain the why is you let people know like where the line is and, and how they can step over and step back over it. So a perfect example on your constraint. I've had this conversation so many times where I'm like, when you send me the file, take your constraints off them. Or sometimes I'm like, leave them on. But here's why I need them. But then that gives the person the flexibility to go, oh, okay, well, um, maybe I do need them. So I'm going to keep my constraints on them. But right when I send you the file, I'm going to take them off and send them over to you. Now they know how to operate and you're not in this like, well, why do you, in, in our 30 years of scheduling, we always put constraints on or we always don't. You're just more quickly getting, getting to the, um, like, what is the real help for it? And so the why is huge. Also, I, one other thing that came to mind is focus on what your output is. If you're on the owner side, focus on the output you want to receive the most. You know, the middle steps in between if you can eliminate most of that out of your specification and focus on what your output is, it's going to be a much better specification, easier to hold people to account. So, you know, you're never going to be able to go in and say, oh, you know, did Bill or Susan make all these clicks and do all these buttons in P6 and da, 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 da. But you can say, oh, I'm looking at the output and say, you know, um, you can only have X amount of constraints on it, or I'm going to run that Monte Carlo analysis. And the Monte Carlo needs to be here. You know, mm -hmm. or I'm actually looking and focusing mostly on predictability. So you need to figure out ways through your schedule and outputs to prove to me that you're predictable. You know, a lot of times schedule specifications is like it turns people into robots and they're like, I must create this report. I must create this diagram. I must create the, And you've lost the sauce completely on what is the point of the specification. It's, you know, collaboration, but it's collaboration to focus on that predictability or that forecast or whatever you're, you know, you're angling on. People just forget that. And all of a sudden it becomes the report that's important. When in reality, Beautiful, it's, it? no, it's, no, go ahead. Let's, let's take that then. I'm going to probe you here and do a beyond deadlines push. Okay. The job here, you, you, you're a planning and scheduling manager at a major data center company. They've got an outdated scheduling specification. That scheduling specification is 350 pages of software settings with no context, no overarching process, doesn't even reference the projects and doesn't say why. And um, because of that, because of the cycles of teams that have come through the, the, uh, the company, only two out of 32 schedulers have even looked at it. How do you then up, update the specification? The first thing I would start with is taking those 300 pages and putting them by my bedside so I can read them before I go to sleep at night. <laughs> and then you start with what are your program's goals? What are you trying to achieve as a program? The first part is, oh, we want to deliver projects on time. Great, but you got to peel that onion. So how, like, how are you going to go about delivering those projects on time or improving our forecasts? You're, you're eventually going to get to benchmarking and reference class forecasting. I'll, since these are 20 minute episodes, I won't drag people out, but at some point in time, you're going to want to measure your performance off of past projects performance. So you're going to need a data set to do that. And so I would think through in my mind, what are the sorts of things that I'm going to need to put together the blocks to put together to make sure that I get what I need out of that process. And you're going to have to do it in layers. So you're going to have at the very, very base layer, a, a some form of pull planning, last planning, production planning system. And that's going to be needed in your specification. And then you're going to go up from there to your L4 schedule and your L3 schedule. 
And you need to really think through all of those pieces. And I would put all those pieces out, you know, on a whiteboard or, or however you want to lay them out and truly understand, okay, generators are super important to our project. I'm going to need information on generators. When I go write this specification, how am I going to get the various levels of data to improve my predictability on generator delivery and installation? You know, then I would look at those blocks and start to think about who am I working with across my portfolio? So this is like the kind of like the how to side. And this is like the people side of, I have these various general contractors and these schedulers, and they're of all these different levels. How am I going to get them to be able to provide me the data information to improve my predictability? Mm -hmm. And I think when you start going down that lens of it and you put yourself in their shoes. So first off, if you have a 300 page, how to use the software, why don't you create an environment or send them the software that already has that sort of specification set up in it? And then you don't need to do that anymore. If you have low scheduler ability, that's one of the big complaints I hear across the industries. Oh, we have these schedulers and they don't have uh, enough ability or they don't have enough um, bandwidth to do what I'm asking them to do. Great. Figure out what they're doing. You know, maybe they're writing a hundred page narrative or they're having to click all these buttons and get rid of it. Focus on the people. And so I'd look at like, okay, so if I have the stuff I need to do and there's people that need to learn them, what sort of vehicle am I going to use to get them the information? And it's going to be a combination. You know, I'd probably set that out on top of all of it. Okay, so maybe the how-to process stuff, those are all videos, you know? Okay, and then I have mm -hmm. these set of templates and then I have this presentation and then I have the, the document that has some of this other information in it, right? And is there any other new age models? Can I create my own chat bot for schedulers to help them out that specifically is honed on answering the questions that they might come up and ask? And I create that package, you know? And then you're, you're on a roadshow of training and meeting people and talking through it. Because as you mentioned earlier, once you kind of have like what the specification is, you've built it all out, you're going to want to collaborate with people on it. And you're going to go to all the GCs or have them all in a room and say, give me your feedback. What am I missing? What's important to you? What questions do you need to ask? Have that. And then you can package that feedback in, right? And then you can go roll forward with it. And then you also want to create a quarterly bi-yearly review of, okay, we're now using the specification. Do I have any metrics that are tracking whether this is being used and effective? You know, like, hey, my project's not predictable. Well, is your specification healthy? Is it good? And so I think that's where you could also add in some additional, you know, and this is actually what I'm thinking of before I fall asleep, not reading these specifications. Do you know what, what <laughs> you're just, what, I'd, I'd love to probe and push and, and delve further, but the thing going through my mind is what you're actually just describing is almost a perfect guide on how to do management in companies across all functions. And actually, if people, if, if people listening to this want to get good at management, and I don't mean leadership, and I don't mean people management, I mean task management. It sounds like actually creating one of these documents is a very good way of doing it. And I'll, I'll put context in that. Management is the combination of pur purpose, people, and process. People in racy frameworks, so you're determining it's more roles. So what roles is responsible, accountable, um, consulted, and informed on what activities? You've got your purpose, which is your objective. Then you've got key results and measurements and KPIs underneath it. And then you've got your process, which is your how-to documentation. And one of the big tests that I put in place with my managers is I look for three types of management cycles. I look for stand-up and task discussion cycles, very short term. I look for KPI review cycles. So I, I kind of prefer those every three weeks because we run in quarters and three weeks is a quarter, quarter and then i look for learning cycles and learning cycles are every six to 12 weeks for me they're longer where it's taking the trend of kpis across time and understanding whether or not there's core lessons to be learned in the system itself but i think this would be schedulers listening to this this is actually a perfect way if you could say could i just look at the schedule specification for my company 
And then you could say to your manager, do you mind if I just have a look at how I could possibly improve this? This is a perfect way to start developing the micro skills of management that you need to be senior management and vice presidents. And yeah. if you can and it's something that no one ever wants to touch. You're on the way up. Exactly. Yeah. No one wants to do it, but it is the thing that gets you the high job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like most things, you know, I, one other thing I would add is if you're in a environment that is reluctant to change, everything I just described, doing it in one fell swoop, unless you have that sometimes that big leadership or that position, mm -hmm. you create the whole package and then you drip feed it out into the system. So maybe you're just starting with the progress module in the specification and you drip feed that in. Or maybe you're just starting with this reporting piece and you drip feed that in. You need to think about sometimes whether it makes sense to rip the Band-Aid off and do a wholesale change or come in and drip feed. Because you can. You can basically, a lot of the stuff you can plug and play and pull in. And, and that can actually be more helpful. If you're working with some GCs that are reluctant to change, you may deteriorate your relationship coming in and blowing it up. And they'll be just be so blown away by the change that it's hard to get them moving forward. So you got to pick, I think, your spot and read the room a bit on how you're going to go implement specifications as well. Then I'm going to, I'm really going to put you in the hot seat now, Mike, and say, you know, the schedule specification document, there's a reason they've got to 300 pages. It's because people sat down either without a plan or real knowledge of how to do them and just started writing, or they really intended them to be 300 pages. I don't think so. To help our listeners here who are going to have a go at doing this in the way that you just said, so take a tiny piece. Are you going to put together a newsletter that would guide them on the different components of a schedule specification and how to how to maybe do a tiny component of a component and build up from there would you be would you be up for doing that yeah absolutely you know wonderful. i mean i think I'm happily happy to give that out to people as uh guidance to help them moving forward where would they find that we'll put it out uh we'll put a link in the show notes so that'll come wherever you listen to the podcast, Apple Podcast, Spotify Podcast, wherever you're listening, it'll be in the show notes. I'll put a link to it. It may not be in when the show initially drops. Uh, I'll try to, to get it in there. Or you can sign up to our newsletter. That'll be also in the show notes. Or you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find Greg or I on LinkedIn or Beyond Deadlines on LinkedIn. And so we'll just put out a big blast. And the best way to find it, though, is to sign up for our newsletter. It's in the show notes. Simple click, throw in your email. You get a weekly email. Uh, and there's a ton of great content in there as well. Beautiful. Okay, then with that, any closing thoughts or comments, Michael? The specification is such a tool that we have allowed to go get dusty. It's so, so dusty and so, so outdated. It can be used as a massive aid for behavior change, for project improvement, and really start to transition your program into what you'd like it to be. And the key to that is just making sure that you're viewing it through another person's shoes. So whoever is actually going to use your specification, please, please, please walk a mile in their shoes and think about the person who's going to implement it. And if you do that, you're going to write a much better document and a much better, have much better processes. Wonderful. Well, with that, we'll close the episode there. Thank you all for listening. As Mike has said, you can find additional content in the show notes. And you can also subscribe to the podcast and the newsletter in the show notes. And of course, it helps us if you share this with a friend. We're doing this as a hobby on the weekends. It's a lot of fun, but it's great to see those stats go up. And it's actually great. The more people we get, the more messages we get on a weekly basis asking us to cover certain topics. So if you've got any topics as well that you'd like us to cover, just add us on LinkedIn or send us a message. It's simple as that. And with that, thank you for listening. We believe construction planning and scheduling specifications need updating. In order to create the best specification, we believe it is important to focus on the user. 
and lean into the power of collaboration. This example was created by Beyond Deadlines. Be sure to check out their innovative podcast and newsletter. Let's start by covering what's wrong with specifications. First off, they are quite boring, often hundreds of pages long, filled with technical jargon and legal language. The tone of these documents are confrontational, written as a, I got you, instead of helping to build the best plan. Lastly, they lack empathy and don't consider the user. Or more directly, they consider the user a robot who will follow all 236 pages of requests. It's time to change. Hi, my name is Chad. In this section, I'm going to show you how to create milestones for your projects. Project milestones are a critical foundation for our schedules. We'll cover everything you need to know about project milestones, specifically what you need to do why these guidelines exist and how they help, several helpful tips, and lastly, how you can get started. Let's cover exactly what you need to do to be successful. The construction project schedule must include our standardized milestones. We'll provide you with the exact list. You'll add the activities to the schedule, making sure the activity ID and description match exactly as provided. It's as easy as that. Listed below are the standard milestones that are required for the schedule. No need to minimize these. We are going to provide you with everything you need to get started. Notice how these milestones cover key points across the project timeline. This will help with reporting and tracking of the project. If you'd like to add additional milestones, feel free to. If you see a need to change any of these milestones, contact your site scheduler who will help facilitate that change. Let's transition and discuss why following these steps are important. One piece of our standardization puzzle is standard milestones. Due to our large construction program, we import a large number of schedules. As our past data shows, standardization not only saves both of us money but also improves schedule quality. By standardizing, we can both focus on what's most important. Building the project. I'm sure by this point you are excited to get started. Let's cover the five basic steps. First, you'll need to download the template files provided. We've built these templates to be a great place to start. They contain each milestone, have the exact activity IDs and codes. After downloading the file, you can either start building directly in the file or copy and paste the activities. Remember to review sections section 3.1 building the project schedule and section 4.1 baseline review for more guidance. When you're done building the schedule, double check to ensure you have all the milestones still in the file and that activity ids, descriptions and coding haven't changed. Lastly, we've built an automated schedule reviewer to help speed things up. Upload your file and see if you've passed the initial checks. We want you to be successful in building a schedule on our program. Let's cover some helpful tips. The milestones are your starting place. We are counting on your expertise and familiarity with this project, as well as your past experiences, to build the logic that ties these critical milestones together. When in doubt, use the scope provided in programming and the design to help guide you. As you set off to build the schedule, we'll want to see how you directly link the scope to the schedule. We love collaboration. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Our motto is to share early and often. This allows us to work in parallel, finishing planning cycles faster while increasing team alignment. This concludes the project milestone section. Please continue to the next section 3.1 building the project schedule. And remember, don't forget to check out the Beyond Deadlines podcast and newsletter.